This guy, this guy, and this guy all train a lot. But then why can't this guy do what this guy does? Why can't this guy do what this guy does? And why can this guy kind of do what these two guys do, but at nowhere near the same level? There are so many different kinds of exercise, sport, and training available. And while they all fall underneath the category of physical activity, there is a great variety between them. Soccer players need to be constantly running on the field, whereas shot putters only need to expend a great amount of energy in a smaller period of time. With this knowledge, it is actually possible to classify all sport, training, and activity on a continuum of intensity and duration. Activities that spend a large amount of energy in a small period of time can be classified as anaerobic aerobic activities. Conversely, activities that expend less energy over a greater period of time can be classified as aerobic activities. In order to perform well within your chosen sport or activity, it makes sense to specify your training to whichever system the sport requires more. This is considered sport-specific exercise and basically what CSCS or Certified Strength and Conditioning Specialists do. But what is the real physiological difference between somebody who trains anaerobically versus somebody who trains aerobically? It has to do with bioenergetics or the biological pathways used in order to supply the body with sufficient energy in order to complete whatever tasks you were trying to do. As a disclaimer, I'm not going to get super in depth with the biochemistry of this video, namely because I find the details cumbersome and I'm just trying to give you the overall idea. The single most important molecule for the body for all things energy is called adenosine triphosphate or ATP for short. Just about every cellular process requiring energy in our body is dependent on ATP availability. And because of our dependency on it, our body has developed multiple systems in order to have different methods of synthesizing ATP when it's needed. The first and most anaerobic of the systems is the phosphagen system. The phosphagen system is the fastest but least efficient producer of ATP. For that reason, it is the main contributor when the activity you are trying to complete is very short in duration, but very high in intensity. Basically any high intensity activity that is around 10 seconds or less relies largely on the phosphagen system. If you have any basic knowledge on sports supplementation, you've likely heard of supplementing with something called creatine phosphate. There is a lot of research demonstrating the benefits and the positive effects that supplementing with creatine phosphate can provide you. This is because the phosphagen system actually directly relies on the breakdown of creatine phosphate. More readily available creatine phosphate equals more capable phosphagen system equals higher performance. In high intensity but short duration sports such as football or powerlifting, being able to maintain one 100% capacity for an additional even two seconds may be the difference between victory and defeat. The second pathway is glycolysis, which can be described as either fast or slow. Fast glycolysis, as the name implies, more rapidly releases ATP than slow glycolysis, but still not as fast as the phosphagen system. It kicks in more so for activities once they extend past 30 seconds in duration. We've all heard of lactic acid buildup being responsible for the muscle soreness we feel following activity. The flask glycolytic pathway actually results in the formation of lactic acid at the end of it. If you're feeling that burn, it's likely because the fast glycolytic pathway was what your body was relying on, as well as not yet being adapted to that level of stress. Slow glycolysis is the first pathway to actually use the mitochondria within our cells. If you've taken a high school biology course, you've likely been given the meme level of trivia knowledge that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. This is partially accurate. Slow glycolysis is able to synthesize more energy than both fast glycolysis and the phosphagen system over longer periods of time. If you knew that, give yourself a pat on the back. You managed to absorb this information years ago thanks to the public education system. Glad it's working so well. I still had to teach myself how to pay taxes and invest, however. But who who needs that? No, it's not, it's not relevant at all. The final pathway is the oxidative pathway. It is the most aerobic pathway that we have available to us. This is the pathway that we rely on for pro long periods of activity, anything greater than three minutes in duration, or just being at rest. So if you've ever wondered what ultra marathoners and couch potatoes have in common, it's they both use this pathway. The oxidative pathway is by far the most efficient method of producing ATP, but is quite slow in doing so. These four energy systems all operate in their continuum. That is to say they are all always active in some capacity, but the dominance shifts depending on what activity we are currently being exposed to. Every sport either focuses 
focuses on one or a combination of these systems. Top performing athletes within a sport also coincidentally hone the specific biological pathways to their sport. This is why strength athletes on average suck at cardio and why endurance athletes, again on average, aren't particularly strong. A strength athlete will have spent time developing their phosphagen system and anaerobic pathways, whereas an endurance athlete would have spent time haunting their oxidative system and their aerobic pathways. Suddenly introducing these individuals into a sport that relies heavily on the opposite pathways without the proper conditioning will result in a subpar performance. Thank you so much for watching guys. Please subscribe down below. Click here for the most recent video and click here for the previous one. Have yourselves great days.